Hello, everybody. Uh, this is uh, Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Well, I just realized that uh, I've had a, a full-time ministry now for 10 years. Uh, this is March of 2015, and it was about March of, of uh, 05 that uh, I began a full-time ministry. Uh, I realized this because I, w I was in a conversation with Brother Ben. Uh, I, I had a document that I was working on and just a memor uh, significant dates in my life. And uh, so I, as I was looking at these significant dates, uh, I realized that uh, it's been 10 years now in full-time ministry. Well, let me reflect on this and tell you some of the main conclusions I have now 10 years. Uh, well, first of all, I, I've been saved for more than 10 years. I, I got saved in December of uh, uh, 1986. So it's been... Uh, 28 and a half years since I got saved. I, I made a video talking about my uh, uh, testimony of how I got saved. It's, you can watch that and to get more detail, but basically it's uh, uh, my mother died and it was the first death in my family, the first death of uh, a loved one and it caused me to question life and question what's the purpose of life. And, what happens after we die? And not so coincidentally, at the same time, the, the movie Jesus of Nazareth uh, came on TV. And as I watched the movie, it really affected me. I, I had seen the movie before, and I grew up as a Roman Catholic, but I didn't really understand biblical Christianity. But at the end of the movie, it uh, said, uh, as it scrolled down and showed all of the, uh, uh, you know, the, the actors, the directors, and so on, it, it, the, the credits. The last thing on the screen it said, for more information, read the Bible. So that's what inspired me. I, I decided, well, I'm going to look at the Bible. Maybe I can get the answers I need from the Bible. And so that was December of 1986 that's when I began reading and studying the Bible and I've been reading and studying it you know, ever since uh, there's never been a time where I, I haven't been interested in, in reading and not only the Bible but uh, books about the Bible uh, of the commentators uh, Bible scholars and so on um, but so I, I've been um, saved, and I, by the way, I got saved as I read the Bible, as I read the Gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, particularly the Gospel according to John, uh, I got saved. Uh, I got saved before I, I reached the epistles of Paul. So this is one of the reasons I highly object and, and to and, and resent the paul onlyism viewpoint that you can only be saved by the writings of Paul. And there is no salvation for us. There's no salvation message uh, anywhere in the scriptures apart from Paul's letters. I know I got saved by reading the Gospel of John. Uh, so, I spent a long time, I've been saved, and you know, right after I got saved, I uh, I was a little bit shy. Of course, I told my, my wife and my son, and, you know, I began to tell my immediate family about my new faith. But uh, I wasn't confident and bold enough uh, to, with my knowledge, to start telling everybody, you know, everybody I knew and even strangers, as I do now, as, as I've been doing for many years in uh, public evangelism. But uh, gradually, I, I got more confident and, uh, you know, through my studies, on how to witness. First thing at class I took was a course called Evangelism Explosion by D. James Kennedy. And that was my first uh, instructions on 
on how to witness and how to present the gospel. <clears throat> so I, I gradually got more confident and more bold and started telling more and more people. Uh, I realized that a lot of people thought of me as very different and bizarre, and, uh, even like a freak, a Jesus freak. <laughs> uh, but uh, during that time, you know, I was uh, I was 36 years old, and so for many years, you know, I was busy working with responsibilities and had to earn a living and, and support my family and invest for my future. And I reached a point where um, I really wanted to do full-time ministry, but I couldn't afford to. I, I, I needed to work. So I began praying for the Lord to bless me with wealth. And uh, I won't go into all the details, but uh, uh, I, I developed a plan and invested and it didn't take very long. I became wealthy enough to, to retire. I retired in December of 2004 at the age of 54. I was able to retire. I was financially secure. Uh, I, uh, however, I didn't anticipate that soon after I retired, I would develop all kinds of health problems. And for that reason, uh, you know, I, uh, I haven't been able to retire to, to, to the, with the, uh, financial abundance that I thought I would have, but God's always provided all my needs. Uh, I'm not, I'm not lacking. And uh, my wife and I are very blessed. And we live a very good life. We're able to pay our bills. We're able to um, enjoy life, have some recreation. Um, but I'm, I'm no longer, I would call myself, you know, rich or wealthy as I, as I was at one point. Um, but God did answer my prayers. He pro provided me the means to retire early. And since that time, December of 04, uh, I, I made a plan I needed to go into ministry. I didn't know what type of ministry I should do. Um, however, I had many years of experience in public speaking because of the various jobs and work I had. I, I'd probably given speeches to audiences of people, uh, you know, uh, more than a thousand times. Uh, so I was very comfortable in speaking to an audience. I was very comfortable speaking to individuals. Uh, um, so that was, uh, I felt that my gift and my calling should be evangelism. And I, I, at about that time, I also started watching a show on TV called The Way of the Master. Uh, even though I made videos against The Way of the Master, and I don't agree with their message for salvation, because it's not, it's not uh, a free gift. You, with The Way of the Master, you've got to repent of your sins and change your life. It, it's, it's faith and works. Uh, so I didn't like that, but I did like the uh, some of the techniques and the boldness of the, the public um, street, open air preaching is what they called it. Street preaching is what I came to know it as. So that gave me, uh, got me interested and got me started doing uh, open air preaching. And that's what I began to do here in Las Vegas, known as Sin City. I became Sin City Preacher. And uh, I went out publicly, uh, you know, three or four times a week. Uh, I would go out uh, to Las Vegas Boulevard. It's called the Las Vegas Strip. And we have about over 30 million tourists coming to Las Vegas every year. And there's a constant flow of people walking down that strip as tourist sightseeing. And it was a perfect location for me to set up and and do my preaching, but because of health problems, I was no longer able to stand and preach. I had to sit in a wheelchair and preach, and I've done that for many years. I haven't done it for a couple of years because uh, I, I haven't been able to find a preaching partner. I, I believe that uh, Jesus sent the apostles and disciples out in pairs. He did it for a reason. Uh, he, I think we're supposed to work with a partner. And uh, 
I've worked with a lot of people over the years, but unfortunately, uh, they they all turned out really to be preaching a false message, and I had to separate myself from them. These uh, uh, street preachers uh, that are repreaching, repreaching uh, continually uh, works message. So uh, let me make sure this video is still recording. It looks like it might have shut off. No, it's still going. Okay, very good. Um, and then I, I ended up having one particular partner, Brother Frank, for quite a long time. And uh, it was a blessing working with Brother Frank. And then we had a falling out uh, when I decided to make, start making videos against Paul Oleism. So uh, I haven't been street preaching for a couple of years, uh, but I've been very busy on YouTube. And so since basically March of 05 to present, I've been busy doing some kind of um, street preaching and YouTube ministry uh, in evangelism. So it's 10 years. It's, it's a milestone. And uh, it's been quite an experience. Uh, particularly my experience on YouTube has given me a chance to meet a lot of interesting people, discuss a lot of interesting subjects, and not only teach, but also learn a lot. And, uh, and some of my uh, opinions and, and doctrines have changed because of that. I've been willing to listen to people, listen to other viewpoints on doctrines. And uh, on a few occasions, the other side won out and they persuaded me. And uh, I changed camps. Uh, the core doctrines that I think are essential uh, um, even though they've been tested over the years, people have argued against them uh, to me. Uh, they, they've held the test of time. And, and uh, the doctrine that Jesus is eternal God Almighty. He's not a creature. He's, he was not created by God. He's not merely a prophet. Not, not merely just a great moral teacher. He is eternal God Almighty. That core doctrine uh, has held true now for 28 years. I don't expect to ever change my opinion on that. Also, the doctrine that salvation is a free gift uh, by grace, by the grace of God alone, through faith alone, no works are required, but the faith must be in Jesus Christ. So it's salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. That doctrine has held, stood the test of time, and I don't expect it. I'll ever change my mind on that. And then the third doctrine, these three doctrines I call my three-legged stool that I rest on, and that is eternal security, that once a person does put their faith in Jesus completely and they receive this gift of eternal life, that they can never lose their salvation for any reason. God won't take it away, and they can't even give it back if they, if they decide they don't want it anymore. They're stuck with it. We have eternal security. Once we're saved, we're always saved. So these core doctrines have never wavered, but in other, on other theological questions, I've changed my mind on a few occasions. Um, so that's been my experience for 28 years, uh, being a Christian, uh, learn, teaching and learning and witnessing, and then for the last year, 10 years, really a full-time ministry. Um, but there's a, a few things I want to add to this today. This is kind of a, a celebration video of the 10 years of full-time ministry. But I want to talk about a couple of principles today, too, to finish this off. Uh, there's a concept called Occam's Razor. What is Occam's Razor? Uh, let's look at just what Wikipedia says about it. Uh, it's at Occam's Razor, also written as Occam. And it's spelled O-C-C-A-M or O-C-K-H-A-M. Occam's razor, and in Latin, well, I don't know how to pronounce that, which means law of parsimony, is a principle uh, or problem-solving problem principle devised by William of Occam. Around 12, he lived from 1287 to 1347. He was an English Franciscan friar and scholastic philosopher. Obviously, Franciscan friars, I, I, I would disagree with him all kinds of theology, being Roman Catholic, but uh, uh, that doesn't mean that uh, 
he's 100% wrong, wrong on everything in life just because he's a Roman Catholic. Uh, so he developed this principle, or and uh, it's named after him, Occam's Razor. Uh, he's a philosopher, a theologian. The principle, the principle states that among competing hypotheses that predict equally well, the one with the fewest assumptions should be selected. Uh, other more complicated solutions may ultimately prove to provide better predictions, but in the absence of differences in predictive ability, the fewer assumptions that are made, the better. So if I was going to sum up Occam's razor in my own words, uh, I would say the simplest answer is probably the best or most correct answer to the question. If we apply Occam's razor to theology, uh, it's really uh, helpful in that if we if we were to look at the questions of uh, creation uh, and uh, not only uh, the question of life, beginning of life, uh, but it, but in Darwinism, the development or the evolution of life, uh, they have to have an awful lot of assumptions. Uh, and because of all the assumptions, all of the questions, it's very complicated how um, life originated and then and then it, it ended up, uh, you know, with nothing behind it, just uh, a a force called that they call natural selection, which really doesn't have the ability to do what they claim it does. But just through natural selection, but no guidance from intelligence or a mind or God, that step by step, given enough time, we evolve to our present state of life. Well, there's an awful lot of assumptions there. So Occam's razor would would tell us that uh, no, it is far far better to adopt the philosophy that that is the simplest, much simpler, and that is that God made us. Just as we are, and it's uh, it's like the the Darwinist or the, or the theist, the the atheist or the anti-theist. Uh, they would say, well, this is what they call God of the gaps. In other words, if you don't have an answer, you just assume, well, it, well God did it. You know, we I can't give you the answer to everything, but God's the answer. Well, that is the simplest answer, according to Occam's Razor. Uh, the the most intelligent approach is. No, we didn't evolve piece by piece, part by part, gradually, and, and there's all kinds of problems with these kinds of assumptions. It's far more logical to take Occam's razor and believe that, no, uh, God created us. We didn't come from nothing uh, with, with no guidance. No, you know, There was intelligence behind it because of DNA and the, the information in DNA, because of the complexity of the design. Uh, it, it's uh, much more logical and simple to assume that there is a mind behind it and a creator, and this creator is called God. So Occam's razor is helpful. I've never talked about it before, but it's a... Uh, it's a it's a philosophical principle I think that makes a lot of sense to justify uh, uh, theism, creationism, and Christianity. Uh, another uh, another uh, thing I want to discuss from uh, uh, principle would be where is that Pascal's wager. Pascal's wager. <laughs> let's look at that. That's another interesting principle. Um, and uh, let's look at Wikipedia. What, how Wikipedia defines Pascal's wager. It says Pascal's wager is an argument in apologetic philosophy devised by the 17th century French philosopher, mathematician, and physicist Blaise Pascal. Lived from 1623 to 1662. It posits that humans all bet with their lives either that God exists or not. Given the possibility that God actually does exist, and assuming an infinite gain or loss associated with belief or unbelief in said God, as represented by an eternity in heaven or hell, 
a rational person should live as though God exists and seek to believe in God. If God does not actually exist, such a person will have only a finite loss, such as some pleasures or luxuries, or assuming that uh, if they choose theism, that they will, their lives will be changed in some ways and they will live more moral life and uh, not, a, not a life of just pursuing, you know, physical pleasures and materialism. That's the point here, which that's really not part of Christianity. Christianity does not require that we, we uh, live like a, a monk. We can, um, but that's part of Pascal's wager is that there is, uh, what have you got to gain? What have you got to lose? Um, if you put your faith in God, you get to, yeah, and God does exist, you go to heaven. Uh, and if you put your faith in God and it doesn't exist, you haven't lost anything except maybe if you gave up some worldly pleasures. So, uh, in my words, I would sum up uh, Pascal's wager as, uh, why not believe in God? And in my case, I'm arguing, why not believe in Christianity? Put your faith in Jesus Christ. What have you got to lose? Okay. So, uh, these are two ideas, uh, Occam's Razor, Pascal's Wager, uh, that uh, I haven't really talked about in the past, but I think they're philosophical ideas that that uh, really a, a person, this, this should enter into your decision uh, about uh, believing in God, believing in creation, believing in the Bible, believing in Christianity, believing in Jesus Christ for your salvation. The final things I want to talk about are just a couple of principles that I've talked about in the past regarding um, how to understand the scriptures and, make, and, and have your develop your doctrines and your conclusions. I was fortunate right after I got saved, uh, uh, I was, started listening to a radio show called The Bible Answer Man. <clears throat> and the man that uh, was... Uh, the Bible Answer Man, originally, it was named Dr. Walter Martin. Uh, today, the Bible Answer Man show is still on the radio, but Walter Martin is with the Lord. He's been deceased now for, I don't know, maybe 10 or 15 years, I guess. So there's another one, Bible Answer Man, called Hank Hanegraaff. And uh, I've watched a lot of Hank Hanegraaff's videos, and I don't agree with him entirely on a lot of things, but I believe that when Walter Martin was the Bible Answer Man, and I got his book, Kingdom of the Cults, and I bought all the audio lessons that he produced, and many of his audios, and I, I think that uh, by my own study of the scriptures and listening to Bible Man, Answer Man, Walter Martin, uh, I developed these core doctrines and opinions on other, other doctrines. Uh, and that gave me a good foundation. Uh, as I said, I've changed my conclusions on some of the minor doctrines over the years. Uh, and then another great influence on me was uh, Dr. Peter Ruckman. Uh, I have about 40 of his books. He's written over 100 books, I guess. And uh, I've communicated with him, too, personally. And he, and he is a fascinating person. He's a genius. Uh, and I... Was, there was a point that I just accepted everything he taught. Uh, KJV onlyism, uh, dispensationalism, and uh, uh, he, he is a brilliant man, and I, I still love him dearly, but I have left his camp in some ways. I'm no longer KJV only. I'm no longer a dispensationalist. Certainly not a hyper dispensationalist or ultra dispensationalist. I've made videos recently against that. Uh, but uh, Dr. Walter Martin and another uh, one that uh, he led me to was Dr., uh, was Clarence Larkin. He has, he has a book called uh, Dispensational Truth with all kinds of charts and graphs and stuff to show timelines that are very very helpful to, to understand. Uh, all kinds of theological questions. So these are very interesting, and these are the ways I got a lot of my information and my uh, conclusions. But then, gradually, I started looking at the other side of all of their, these arguments, and uh, I found out that Walter Martin and uh, and Dr. Uh, Ruckman and uh, Clarence Larkin, uh, I don't think they're 100% correct. Uh, 
Uh, I don't think I'm 100% correct. Uh, there are some some doctrines that I am very confident on, and there's others that I'm pretty confident, and there's others that I have no confidence at all. I don't I don't really claim to understand that particular theological question at all. Um, but I believe that uh, we should come to our conclusion by first looking at the context of a verse. And I'm doing studies now on character studies, and we're discussing the devil and Satan, or Satan. And, and all I'm really doing is just looking at every verse that has the word devil in it, or Satan. And, and I look at the verse. And if you're following what I'm doing, you'll notice that the first thing I do is say, let's get a list of little context. Let's look at the, the verses before and after and try to understand the context of it. So that's the first thing we do. We look at the immediate context, and if we need to, we broaden it and look at the, understand the entire book that the, the verse comes from, and what the book is trying to teach us, what the author is trying to teach us, but we have to always keep it in context of the entire Bible, because the Bible itself is a, has a context. And then, uh, and then the other principle I think is very important, one of the most important things in, in making our conclusions is that uh, we should give more weight to clear verses than unclear verses. There are certain verses that we call proof texts. Uh, I could give you uh, dozens of verses that prove that Jesus is eternal God Almighty. And then you can give me what are called problem verses that, that would seem to argue against that. But the problem verses, uh, we, we try to answer them as best we can. But the problem verses generally are unclear. There's all kinds of debate over them. So there's proof texts for the deity of Christ, and there's problem texts. There's proof texts for faith alone for salvation, and there's problem texts that are, seem to argue against it. Proof texts for eternal security, and problem texts that seem to argue against it. Uh, but the, the proof texts are clear. So we have to give a lot more weight and put a lot more confidence in a verse that clearly states something, that there could be no dispute over the meaning, and, and give a lot less consideration and weight to the verses that are debated by everybody. There's dozens of different opinions on it. Why would I determine my doctrines based on a verse or all the verses that everybody's arguing over the meaning? Um, and then also, I would expand the idea of clear versus uh, debated verses, and I would expand that towards doctrines, too. There's clear doctrines uh, that I, I have complete confidence in, and then there's other doctrines that I have some, I'm somewhat confident, and then there's other doctrines or theological questions or subjects that uh, I just don't have a lot of confidence at all. I don't claim to understand it. So that's the uh, that's where I am now. Uh, it's been 28 years since uh, my new birth, and uh, all this time I've been studying and learning uh, all these various ways and teaching and witnessing. Uh, and these are some of my conclusions now. That these are the the concepts that. Uh, I use to formulate my conclusions. All right, well, I hope this is helpful to you. And it's, it's turned out that this the video was longer than I intended, but uh, I guess it takes a while to kind of recount uh, 28 years of Christianity, 20 years of, of uh, personal evangelism and witnessing, and, 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 and the last 10 years being a full-time ministry. All right, thank you for watching. I'll be interested in your comments. And uh, especially, I, I, I'm always blessed when someone tells me that they've been watching my videos for years. And that's happened several times recently where I, I had no clue that you even exist because some people, they've, they've had no communication with me at all. And yet, at some point, they decide they need to contact me, and they tell me that not only have they been helped by my videos, but they've been watching the videos for years. And 
uh, and now finally they decided to let me know, and it's it's a blessing. It's 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 inspiring to me. It's encouraging to me. It strengthens me. And uh, for all of you who have been watching my videos, and even those of you who uh, correct me, uh, sometimes when you correct me, uh, I I am persuaded, and you've changed my mind. Uh, many times you correct me, and I say no. It's I I think your arguments are weak and and uh, hold, there's holes in it. So, but I, the most important thing that I require is that I, someone has civility, respect, courtesy, um, and even if you disagree, then uh, I can still enjoy having a conversation with you. Now, the last thing I want to tell you is that. If you're not a Christian, if you're not a person who put their faith in Jesus Christ and received the gift of eternal life, I want to tell you now that I'm not asking you to do something difficult or I'm not asking you to take on some kind of a hardship, become a religious person, join a religion and practice the religion and do real, follow a set of religious rules. No, that's not what I would ask you to do. That's, that's um, not going to get anybody into heaven, becoming a religious person. Um, we, we go to heaven because of what Jesus did, not what we do. Uh, we, we go to heaven because of who Jesus is, not who we are. Uh, Jesus is God. He became a man. He said he had to become a man so he could die for our sins, and he did. He died on a cross. He paid for all our sins. So if you're trying to get to heaven by paying for your own sins, by doing good deeds and repenting and begging for forgiveness, and then that's not only unnecessary, but it won't work. Jesus already paid for our sins, and we need to acknowledge that and say, thank you, Jesus. I, I, I know I couldn't do it because the Bible says no one is righteous, not even one, and, and that we cannot go to heaven based upon personal merit. So uh, thank you, Jesus. Uh, I realize I, I couldn't do it. I needed you to do it for me. You paid for my sins. And then he raised himself from the dead three days later to prove he has the power of life and death. And he's offering everyone life everlasting. Uh, it, it's not, uh, you don't have to buy this eternal life by giving to charities or tithing to churches. You don't buy it because Jesus has already paid for it. He paid for it on the cross with his blood. Uh, you don't have to work for it by becoming a religious and good person uh, because we can't go to heaven based upon our works. Jesus already did the work. He he lived a perfect, sinless life. And when you put your faith in him, him, you get credit for his good works, for his good life, for his perfect life. Uh, so you don't have to, you can't buy it. You don't have to work for it or earn it. Uh, all you need to do is believe in Jesus and he gives it to you as a gift. That's why the scriptures say that we're saved by grace. God is gracious. He, he, we don't deserve salvation in any way, no matter how good you think you are. You can take the best person in the world and, and they, they uh, don't deserve to go to heaven because no one is perfect. So, God gives us eternal life simply because God is gracious. That's one of his qualities, his, his, his character. He's gracious, and so we're saved because of his grace, by grace. We're saved through faith. God's gracious, that's his part. Our part is faith. Let's put our faith in God to, to provide salvation. And how did he do it? Through his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus, when we put our faith in Jesus and believe that he paid for our sins, he raised himself from the dead. He does have power of life and death. He will give me eternal life if I just trust him completely and no longer believe in my own ability, but believe in him instead. That's biblical Christianity. That's what I call Christianity, relying completely on Christ. So I hope you'll do that now. Stop struggling, trying to work your way to heaven on your own. Throw up your hands in defeat uh, and uh, surrender and say, I, I realize I can't do it. Thank you, Jesus, for doing it for me. I believe in you. I'm trusting you. And now you give me eternal life. And once once you receive eternal life, it's eternal. It can never be lost. 
and you can't even give it back later, so you're, you'll be stuck with it if you do it. <laughs> so if you do put your faith in Jesus after watching this, please make a comment and let me know. Bless you all, and please rest in the arms of Jesus, in the love and grace of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.